magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Presented as a public service by Standard Oil Company. Restless Trieste, free territory on the Adriatic Sea, long coveted by Yugoslavia and Italy. Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia bluntly demands that Trieste City continue as a free port and the surrounding area be swallowed up by his country. In a show of strength, he orders troops and tanks to the Yugoslav border. In Trieste, the Italian flag goes up throughout Zone A amid the cheers of the people as the United States and Great Britain announce plans to turn over control of the section to Italy. Across the Adriatic in the land of Tito, reaction is violent. Anti-American mobs stream through Yugoslav cities. Stones are thrown through doorways and windows of United States consulates as Trieste once again becomes Europe's powder cake. In South Korea, thousands of students in Seoul demand the withdrawal of Indian troops following a clash between the soldiers and anti-communist prisoners of war at repatriation camps. Signs call upon the United Nations to censure India as new trouble shakes troubled Korea. French Union troops punch doggedly ahead in an all-out drive to smash the red nightmare that has clung to the rice fields and jungles of Indochina for seven years. The wounded must travel with the French forces, who now rake the communist Viet Minh rebels with shell fire. A bold new attack in an ugly old war. Thousands of guests swarm into a circus tent at Hershey, Pennsylvania to attend a mammoth colorful birthday party for President Eisenhower. Under the big top, a giant cake stands lighted and ready to be sliced. But first, Ike and Mamie enjoy a box lunch that features cold fried chicken. Then later at the Hershey Arena, the president, driving a one-horse shay, arrives with Mrs. Eisenhower for an elaborate entertainment program. Good-naturedly, they circle the path in the huge enclosure, leaving the buggy to mount the platform. In darkness, a candlelight tribute and a lusty chorus. Happy birthday, Mr. President, 63 years young. Flying south to dedicate the new Falcon Dam on the Rio Grande, President Eisenhower is making his first trip outside the country since entering the White House. He greets Mexican President Adolfo Cortines warmly, and the two chief executives join in unveiling monuments, marking the completion of the $47 million project. Two good neighbors with but one goal, the cause of true peace. A five-alarm fire roars through the waterfront district at Oakland, California. Raging flames force 125 firemen to keep their distance while they pour tons of water into the inferno. Flames burst from a huge warehouse where vast quantities of supplies for troops in Korea are stored. The building soon becomes a blazing skeleton, then collapses a total loss. Next morning, a mass of charred wreckage, damage totaling $12 million. For Major General William Dean, New York City puts on a full dress parade. Captured early in the Korean War, he was one of the last prisoners of war released by the communists. Half a million New Yorkers pour out their admiration and affection for the hero of Taejon, a Congressional Medal of Honor winner. Three years of red captivity are forgotten as a smiling old soldier returns from the wars.
ocean floor is the studio of the Italian painter Palumbo, one of those gifted persons who produce unusual works of art. Beneath the waves, he sets up his easel, and as the enclosed camera watches, Palumbo paints marine life and still life in their natural surroundings. He uses special paints on a treated surface to reproduce a wonderful watery world of rippling movement where his subjects forever bow and curtsy to the tide. His day's work done, Palumbo leaves his studio, where no door needs locking and never a visitor disturbs him. Vito Reina of Sicily is an artist cut from different cloth. A tailor, he uses the tools of his trade to create artistic designs. The proper colored swatch is selected by the artist after he has completed a paper pattern of each piece of the design. After it has been cut to the proper shape, the cloth is placed on the pattern. The final step is to sew all the individual bits of cloth together, producing the finished picture. To make one of these masterworks requires more than 500 yards of thread and 1,000 to 1,500 bits of colored fabric. A tailor expresses his artistic feelings in cloth. Shops for the ingredients of his unusual venture in art. Woolen yarn is used by Christophe to make portraits of famous men. Patience and care are required to execute minute details of each portrait. Christoph can make one from an old sweater or even from a few pairs of socks. Among these remarkable portraits are France's President Pinay, former President Truman, President Eisenhower, and the Queen of England. Now let's visit a typewriter artist, Donna Montserrat Escadibol, who uses the keys of her machine to produce portraits on white-coated canvas that bear an amazing faithfulness to the subject. Jumbles of letters and punctuation marks form the tapestry-like reproductions. Donna Montserrat, a Barcelona typist, uses 17 different colored typewriter ribbons to create these vivid canvases. A workaday business machine becomes an artist's brush in the skilled hands of Montserrat Escarivol. Moving day on Washington's Deschutes River. Moving day for hundreds of salmon bound upstream to spawn, but blocked by impassable waterfalls. No salmon visited the Deschutes until the state stopped the river. Now by instinct, descendants of the first salmon return, starting another life cycle. At a fish ladder, workers inspect the salmon, tiny fingerlings when they left the river four years ago. Each scale records the salmon's life, the years it has spent in fresh water, the years in the sea, but not the times it has got away. Big buckets transfer the fish from the river to a special tank truck, which will carry them over roads, bypassing steep waterfalls they can't swim. On other rivers, salmon fight their way upstream, leaping small falls. But for these lucky fish, it's a free taxi ride. They are the grandchildren of the first to shoot salmon. Above the falls, unloading begins. None the worse for their short stay on land, the salmon slide happily back into the river. From here, the fish journey still farther upstream, perhaps hundreds of miles, until they reach the breeding grounds in shallower waters near the river's source. But natural enemies await the fish at the end of their trip. Commercial fishermen on the Pacific coast catch many millions of dollars worth of salmon a year. And amateurs, like this vigilant fellow, manage an occasional fish dinner too. Yes, Mr. Bear is a first-class fisherman. An average adult salmon weighs close to 20 pounds when it returns to the stream where it was born. One fish that size is enough of a meal for any bear. The salmon have returned and a new life cycle begins in the Deschutes River. Here at America.
America's top research laboratory at Langley Field, Virginia, scientists are working on a new type plane with wing surfaces resembling a four-slat section of a Venetian blind. This model, with all four flaps down, rises almost straight up. Capable of high forward speeds, the versatile Venetian blind plane can hover overhead like a helicopter. Models with hydro skis instead of wheels are also tested at the laboratory, operated by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. The hydro skis permit planes to take off and land on water, snow, and even wet sod. Watch as the model is accelerated to flying speed. American aviation research streaks ahead. Later, the Navy tests a jet fighter much like the hydro ski model. It's called the Sea Dart. Security officials tape our cameraman's lenses to prevent any close-up pictures of the plane. The Sea Dart churns up a towering spray as it takes off. After roaring through the skies like a conventional jet fighter, it touches down on its runway of water. Across the sea, a British jet is wheeled from its hangar, test pilot Mike Lithgow at the controls for an assault on the world's aviation speed record. The old and the new meet on the Libyan desert near Tripoli. The course is the road that splits the sand below. The jet makes the first of four low-level passes. Ships of the desert watch as a ship of the sky streaks along to a new world record, 737 miles an hour. Over the desert, the victory roll. The record this day belongs to Britain. America, 10 days later, goes after the mark England has just set. Observers watch the blazing speed of the Navy's Sky Ray jet. Lieutenant Commander James Verdon, congratulations on still a new record, 753 miles an hour. The Air Force's first supersonic jet fighter, capable of low-level flight faster than sound, hurtles into the sky. Called the F-100 Super Saber, the jet's knife-edge wings, swept back to a 45-degree angle, help make possible speeds of better than 12 miles a minute. The sleek silver ship comes in so fast that a drag parachute must snap out to slow its landing speed. Test pilot George Welch's supersonic flight shattered windows along the route of his low-level runs. The Air Force Thunderbirds, a team of trained combat instructors, show what can be done at terrific speeds with the versatile Thunder Jets. Flying in tight formation, 15,000 feet high, tests the judgment and skills so vital in aerial combat. Taking the cue by radio, the four Thunderbirds slip from one formation to another with the precision of a crack drill team. New planes, new speeds, new precision in aviation's jet age. is the House of Clocks at New York University, a fascinating museum filled with a rare collection of 2,500 timepieces, carefully preserved milestones in the history of clocks. The curator of the museum, Professor Edward Conrad Smith, examines an 18th century traveling clock belonging to the collection, which records man's attempts through the ages to measure time. The first timepiece was the sundial, invented in 2000 BC by the Babylonians to follow the daily voyage of the sun in the heavens. The sand glass replaced the sundial for its steady flow produced a more precise measurement of passing time. In medieval days, a marked candle was used with colored bands indicating units of time. The oil lamp clock, used at night, was still another of the primitive methods of keeping time. 
Much like the candle, the jar was marked to record the changing level of the burning oil. With the first mechanical clock in 1316, a new art was born. This elaborate clock is a 17th century Dutch creation. A second example of Dutch craftsmanship, a wooden clock with trip hammer chimes. The Japanese double balance clock is a copy of timepieces introduced in that country by Dutch traders in 1600. Only one of the balances is in operation at a time, switching automatically to the other at daybreak and sunset. The flintlock pistol clock was the 18th century alarm clock. It fired a shot of gunpowder, lighting a candle to permit the owner to read the time. The French calendar clock made in 1815 is a remarkable timepiece, for its intricate mechanism records the days of the month and week, as well as hours, minutes and seconds, and various astronomical signs. Somewhat similar is the American one-month clock, which derives its power from a spring, much like that found in our present-day automobiles. The invention of the pendulum as a time regulator ushered in the modern clock as we know it. This pendulum, which swings in a circle, is not as accurate as the standard type. The new pendulum was adapted by the French to a novel clock with a doll swinging back and forth, on and on. In this timepiece, the clock is its own pendulum. The Tide Clock, an 18th century masterpiece by a British watchmaker, recorded the high and low tides at Southampton. The extraordinarily intricate American cosmochronotrope can tell the time of day at any point on the Earth's surface. A model sun revolves once a year around the rotating globe at the top, illustrating the four seasons, indicating which areas are in sunlight and darkness, and providing an amazingly accurate portrayal of the Earth's role in the solar system. Here at the Museum of Clocks can be found the finest row of American grandfather clocks in existence, many of them 200 years old. They too are chapters in the histories of man's search for new instruments to measure the never-ending passage of time, the image of eternity. Liner streaks through the Canadian Northwest, carrying a party of American geologists toward a glacier adventure. Engineer James Kirk steps up the speed as the Silver Serpent winds its way into the Rockies of Alberta, rolls past the station at Lake Louise, and into a lofty world of contrasting wildness and beauty. Kirk, a veteran railroader, guides the streamliner as it skirts a picturesque lake and roars over the Great Divide, the mountain backbone of the American continent. Thundering on, the train approaches one of the countless tunnels chiseled through the stubborn walls of towering peaks. Seconds later, emerging from the inky darkness, the windshield is spattered with moisture from the tunnel's rocky interior. Now, nearing the end of the first leg of the journey, the engineer sounds a traditional salute to an old friend in a shaggy coat. We are in the midst of the Canadian wilderness. The second leg of the journey is not by horse. The horses will be carried by truck as far as there are roads. Then high in the Rockies where the roads end, the horses' work will begin. First over sharp rocks and then treacherous ice. The 
The third and final leg of the ascent is about to begin. The fate of the expedition rests now on the sturdy, sure-footed pack horses, which must scale the tricky paths that twist through the mountains toward the Saskatchewan Glacier. The party loads the equipment needed to study its geological development. Formed on mountain slopes, glaciers are giant masses of ice and snow, which, when they reach depths of around 100 feet, creep down the mountainside under their own weight, cutting, scraping, filing, and polishing the rocks over which they pass. The bitterly cold streams, made milky by melting ice from the glacial reservoir to the north, are severe challenges for the pack horses as they pick their way through the freezing currents. With practice skill, a veteran guide leads a balky horse out of the stream. The climb continues, but now the expedition is skirting the ice cap, a glistening remnant of the prehistoric ice age. And in the eerie shelter of the surrounding mountains, horses and men first set foot on the tongue of the Saskatchewan glacier. A great sheet of ice, hundreds of miles square and in places thousands of feet thick, the most powerful force of erosion to attack the Earth's high places. On the peak of the ice cap, men unload the pipes which will measure the depth of the frigid mass and the generator needed to power the equipment used in the tests. Scarring the face of the glacier are yawning crevasses, ruptures in the ice caused by tensions far below its surface that sometimes stretch hundreds of feet in length and plunge to the very bottom of the great white blanket. But now the tests begin. Sections of the aluminum pipe are joined to the bit, which, after it is heated red hot, will sear through the brittle ice. Clues to the structure and movement of the glacier can be found in measuring its depth. Glaciers which once covered most of the American continent are gradually retreating northward as the earth grows warmer. Exploring the area surrounding their camp, two members of the expedition spy a glacial water spout in the distance. When streams running beneath the ice are blocked, the water is forced upward to create a strange ice-cold geyser. Huddled on a rocky oasis, the party surveys a vast desert of snow and ice. The one million year old Saskatchewan glacier cradled on the shoulders of the Canadian Rockies.